In our last episode, we talked about our top 20 must-haves when we bought the Elliott. However, there were three items that we didn't get on that list uh, that we'll need to really transform a liveaboard dock queen to a real cruiser. Since our kids have all left the house, our goals are to A, move from land to water on a liveaboard, B, keep working for the next 10 to 15 years, and C, just be able to cruise around the Pacific Northwest and the San Juan Islands as much as we possibly can. However, if that's going to happen, we have to address not only the missing must-haves, but there's also a couple of items that we have to do to enable us to be able to cruise and be at anchor where it's really out of reach of some basic conveniences for sometimes weeks on end. Here are our top five refit items that we tackle to turn our dock queen into a cruiser. Starting with number five, if you don't have the proper ground tackle, you're not gonna be able to anchor. And this boat came with a 44 pound delta, 25 feet of chain, and 200 feet of line. It's just not enough to do anything more than just sit on a lunch hook and enjoy a nice sunny day. That wasn't gonna work for us. So we had to take a completely different route. We threw a 77 pound arachna on the end of this bad boy, 150 feet of chain, and 200 feet of eight rate line. So we're set for the worst of worst conditions and enjoying the best of the best. Number four, if you can't keep your butt in the seat, you can't navigate less than calm waters. So we had to get a new seat. True that. And this helm seat was particularly bad. Not only had it rotted out from all the water leaking to it over the years, but you couldn't even see over the helm. So number three in turning our dock queen into a cruiser is having energy. And when I say that, if you don't have enough energy, well, you're gonna have to rough it a little bit. Conserve, do without, and that is not our game plan. We wanna have a liveaboard with all the conveniences of home, and we wanna be able to be away from the dock. To be able to do that, power is mandatory. First of all, let's talk about how much power we need. Uh, you know, in the morning, when we're making coffee and we're taking showers, uh, you know, we're going through, we're heating up the boat, uh, you know, and we're making a nice comfortable space for ourselves. We can jump up to six, 7,000 watts sometimes, uh, really could go as high as 8,000 watts. Now, when you talk about those types of loads, there's only a handful of ways, at least traditionally, that you can get that kind of energy, and we'll talk about those. Number one is shore power. We have a 240 volt shore power connection, and that's at 50 amps. So if you do the quick math, that's 12,000 watts. That's more than enough to power anything that we just talked about. But shore power is like death and money. You can't take it with you. So when we leave the dock, we better have some other options. The second way you get power, and this is the most traditional, is to go through and just have a big gen set. So, you know, when you're running your loads, uh, you just start your gen set and you're totally fine. The only challenge with that is, during most of the day, we only use 500 watts. Now it's an absolute shame to run a gen set that's only using 20% of its power, burning fuel at the same time for small loads like that for the entire day. Now one might say, well, use your gen set for heavy loads and do an inverter for small loads, but then you're having to jump back and forth constantly, and quite frankly, it's hard on your generator and you're running your generator for lengths of hours that you don't have to. So hey, it isn't the perfect solution for us. The next one is renewable energy. Now this is basically solar and wind. Uh, our hardtop is pretty big, but there's no way we have 8,000 watts worth of power that we can pull in from solar on that. Maybe once we get that done, we'll be able to get 3,000 watts. That'll be good to keep a battery system topped off, but it's just not an option for our heavy loads. 
That brings us to the fourth option of being able to get energy. Now, if you watched our top 20, having an inverter was a big thing to us. And we got a lot of comments back in different forums as well as on YouTube, basically saying, you're crazy to have an inverter. In fact, people on the East Coast just say, use a gen set, get the biggest one you can and you're good. I think that makes a lot of sense. Most inverters don't go over 3000 watts. So that kind of pushes you into a generator again. Let's take all of those concerns because they're all real in the past. So dream with me, if you will. Let's say you could have an inverter that would give you 8,000 watts. And I don't mean peak 8,000 watts. I mean a sustained 8,000 watts can, can peak over that to 10,000 watts. A lot of people will say that just doesn't simply exist. The second part of this is having to watch your batteries constantly. It's just a pain in the butt. And I, I totally agree. But what if you had batteries you didn't have to watch? Um, they just took care of themselves. And what I mean by that is, you know, when their state of charge gets low, the gen set just automatically turns on and takes care of them and charges them back up. And you don't have to watch that at all. You might say, I can't be on the boat to be able to watch the system all the time. Well, what if you could basically watch the system on your phone or your computer from your bed or from home or from another country for that matter? And you could even do things like start the gen set if you saw that you wanted to do that manually. I don't know why you would, but what if you could? Because you can. Because you can. <laughs> now you might also say, yeah, but I don't want to have a gen set just turning on any time that it, it wants to be able to turn on and charge my batteries, especially if you're a small, quiet anchorage, you're going to lose a lot of friends that way. What if that generator was smart enough to have quiet hours and not turn on unless things were absolutely critical for the battery bank? That'd be a pretty sweet setup. Now this is the best and last piece. How many times have you been at the dock and this always seems to happen in the morning when everyone's pulling as much wattage as they possibly can? Um, the breaker flips, right? And in the morning you're generally in your PJs or maybe something less. You gotta go get out on the dock, you gotta flip the breaker, you gotta take loads off the system. That's a total pain. Walk of shame. The walk of shame. <laughs> <laughs> what if you had an inverter system that started saying that you were pulling far too much load from the breaker on the dock and you were ready to trip it and then started actually using energy from your batteries? That would be wonderful. That is not just a dream that can actually happen. In fact, that's exactly what we built our refit on. We have a Victron 8,000 watt inverter. It has auto gen set start. It monitors itself. Uh, we can access any of that information on the internet, keep track of the loads. Uh, it's an amazing install. Now, here's the flip. This is what everybody's probably saying. Great, John, you've addressed the issue around the inverter. Um, how in the world are you going to get that much power into your boat? The batteries are messy. Lead acid is terrible. It would cost a fortune to have that many batteries uh, on top of it. They weigh a ton. Look, I did the math. If we were going to have two and a half times the power on hand in reserve, we'd probably have to have 14 AGM batteries. I go with AGM because they're clean, so we don't have to worry about the lead acid side. Now, 14 AGM batteries. You're talking $8,000, you're talking 2,200 pounds. And if you use them down to a 50% floor, um, gosh, it would take you six hours to recharge them when you talk about absorb time as well. Uh, that just doesn't make any sense. And adding that much weight to the boat, that kind of expense, people would say an inverter is silly. However, what if I could do all of that with 12 batteries that are the size of the battery in your car? weighing just 600 pounds and being able to recharge them in just under three hours. You might say, I'll bet you're talking about lithium iron phosphate and we absolutely are. The next thing you're probably going to say is that'd be far too expensive. And you're right. I mean, if we did something like that, it'd be $24,000 and sure it would work, but that's a lot of money just for batteries. You can, you can burn a lot of fuel and do a lot of services on gen sets for that kind of money. It wouldn't make any sense. Um, we were able to find lithium iron phosphate batteries that have 40 cycles on them. Lithium iron phosphate batteries have 4,000 life cycles associated with them. It's less than 1% of the lifetime that's been used on them. So let's do some quick math on that. We could be on the hook for 100 days a year for 40 years. Uh, these batteries are going to outlive our lifetime. We were able to buy these batteries less than what lead acid costs 
and we get all of these benefits. They're light. They only weigh 600 pounds. That weighs less than the five AGM 8D batteries that we have on this boat that only account for the equivalent of like 25% of that same power. It's crazy. The other part is the gen set loves them because when it comes time to recharge them, we can put the gen set at 80% low. Diesel gen sets love that. So in a little over two hours, we're able to recharge those and we're able to have all of that power that we can use for the next day or two and never have to run the gen set. So you keep the hours down, you keep the maintenance down on the gen set and you're able to have all the power you need regardless if it's 500 watts or 7,500 watts. Cleanliness, think about it, it's the same type of technology that's in your phone. You never worry about the acid spilling out of those. They're insanely safe. You know, you've heard a lot about lithium batteries catching fire. They absolutely do, but that's a completely different chemistry than lithium iron phosphate. In fact, most of the cars nowadays, that's exactly what they have in them, so you don't have to worry about risk of fire. Most lithium iron phosphate batteries have what they call a battery management system on them, a BMS. So a BMS is there to protect the batteries. So what happens is when the battery gets too low or too high, the BMS will literally cut the battery off from any load or any charge to make sure to protect them. Well, that's great for the batteries, but if you're cruising along in Deception Pass up in the Pacific Northwest here that can have currents of 15, 16 knots, um, and your battery system shuts off, you could lose your autopilot, you lose all your electronics. At the end of the day, that simply can't happen. So we made the decision to keep the systems completely separate. We have a standalone 12 volt system that runs all of our house systems that run on 12 volt, and we have a standalone inverter system. It works out perfect for us. So to recap, we ended up with a Victron 48 volt, 8,000 watt inverter system that automatically turns on the gen set when the battery bank is low, and it ensures that you never blow the fuse on the dock. How awesome is that? And on top of it, we have a redundant 12 volt system, so we never have to worry about the risk of our lithium ion phosphate batteries cutting out from the BMS and creating risk or a shutdown on the boat. The perfect setup for what we do and having a cruiser. Number two, if you don't have a water maker, you're only gonna be able to go out on the hook for maybe four or five days. And our tank only holds about 135 gallons of water. So in order to go out for a couple weeks, out on the hook in the San Juan Islands or up in Canada, we were gonna have to get a water maker. So that was definitely something that was important to us. That brings us to number one. We doubled down on our electronics. Actually, we tripled down on the electronics. And what I mean by that is we have three multifunction displays at each helm station, one down in the pilot house and one up here on the bridge. Now you might say, why in the world would you have that many screens? That's overkill. Now if you stop and think about it, what information goes on those screens? So obviously charts. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of obstacles up here in the Pacific Northwest. We're not cruising off the coast uh, and we really need to know what's going on underneath us because a lot of people run aground up here. Now. You might say, great, charts, that's one screen. You should be done with that. On top of that, you have radar. Uh, we're a big fan of having our radar on a separate screen, even though we can layer the radar on top of our charts. Okay, maybe you're at number two as far as having multifunction displays, but this is where it gets interesting. Engine information, we have a fully integrated system for our Volvo D6s into our Raymarine uh, multifunction displays that basically has all of your engine information layered on top of itself in a really easy consume fashion. On top of it, when we talk about safety, so we've had the experience over the past three years that every time we go out in the season, early in the season usually, yeah, we end up picking somebody out of the water. And when I say picking somebody out of the water, yeah, we mean out of the water, kayaker or someone who fell overboard. Yeah. or windsurfers that have lost the kite and they're floundering in the water. Um, we've had all three of those incidents take place. So it's been super important to us to put in some systems where we can really identify those types of uh, incidents as well as there's a lot of debris in the water up here because of all the rivers and estuaries that we have. So we ended up putting in a FLIR thermal camera. It not only is able to pick out thermal signatures of people in the water. It also is able to identify any debris that's in the water, as well as 
boats uh, that might be crossing our path at the nighttime. The next one is augmented reality cameras. Now you're probably saying, what the heck is that? But if you think about um, all the great information that we have nowadays that's coming in through our navigation systems, we have AIS, uh, it knows where the markers are from our charts. Uh, it's able to know dynamically what our heading is as well. If we had cameras that could lay all of that on top of an image that's in front of you, it'd make it a lot easier in rolling seas when you're trying to identify a marker with your binoculars that might be very hard to see. If that was overlaid on your camera, it, you'd be able to know exactly where that marker is and navigate much more quickly and safely. So we added those cameras both to the forward and the stern of the boat. Uh, the last piece is we did a complete integration of all of our stereo systems and all of the Victron systems that we talked about as well. So we're not having to run around to our electrical panels or different stereo heads. We can control all those things from one spot just like you do in your car. And the last thing that we did to splurge a little bit was get a wireless VHF. So when we're going to the marina, and the harbor master's giving you directions as far as what slip to go in, if it's bow in or stern in, or putting out fenders, you don't have to run back to the VHF and have them repeat that. You can just stick it in your pocket and have it accessible at all times wherever you are on the boat. And quite frankly, cords on radios, that's so 1980s. <laughs> So thank you for spending your time with us and reviewing the top five refit items that we did on the Elliott to turn her from a dot queen into a long-term cruiser. So hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, and stay tuned to find out what happens next time. <laughs>